The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. We will wait a couple of minutes, three minutes, to see if uh, there are a few latecomers, and then we start. Sorry, good afternoon, everyone. I, it's afternoon for you. Okay, I think we, we can start. So, good afternoon, everyone, again. Um, this is uh, the first webinar in a series that we would like to implement uh, to show the results of the um, activities implemented through the grant scheme of ECPGR. And we realized after um, two phases of ECPGR and now 45 activities that it would be nice to give more uh, visibility to what uh, is happening in the in the various working groups, and um, and so we have decided to to start this series. So this is the first test, and we thank very much uh, Jean Paul Sampu and Evelyn Wilner. But Jean Paul will will present. Uh, they will uh, uh, show the results of the activity uh, carried out by the Forages Working Group. This activity is called the Facilitating Use on the European Perennial Ryegrass Collection, Improving Access to Genetic Resources and Characterization and Evaluation Data, or shortly, Improve Lolium Call. It is an activity that uh, is managed, has managed to improve the number of accessions in Eurisco and in Aegis, and also uh, add uh, new characterization data to Eurisco. And uh, Jean-Paul will explain also other interesting results. I need to tell you that um, we will have this presentation of about 20 minutes, and then we open for questions. We thought to, to split the questions in two groups. The first group will be dedicated to uh, steering committee members to ask questions about uh, um, how this uh, grant scheme has worked and um, and uh, whether objectives of ECPGR have been uh, achieved or good or bad experiences, something like that. And then uh, um, another part of the discussion will be dedicated more to scientific questions. So we thought we we try to split in this way, but uh, this is a test again. And um, you are all muted and you cannot use the chat. So the only thing that you're allowed to do <laughs> will be to raise hands and um, you should be able to see the raise hand button on the right side. Um, there is a column with uh, Mute, unmute, uh, camera, and uh, and hand raised. So you should be able to do that, but nothing else. So um, I would ask now uh, Jean Paul Sampu to appear and show up for one second, and then uh, start his presentation. 
Jean-Paul. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for attending this webinar. And the first thing I will present myself. I am Jean-Paul Sampou from INRAE, and I was the coordinator of this activity with Evelyn Villner. So this activity, Improve Lyon Call, was a contribution of the ACPGR Working Group for Forages to meet oh, uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, this activity was a contribution of the ACPGR Working Group for Forages to meet the objectives of ACPGR Phase 9, and it was granted by the sixth call of Phase 9 Grand Scheme in 2018. The main objective of the, of the activity was to bring progress towards objectives 1 and 2 of Phase 9 for perennial ryegrass which is a major forage grass species. With this same, it took opportunity of data and results provided by the research project Grass Landscape, which started in 2015. The Grass Landscape project was founded by the 2014 Phase GPI Aeronet Call Climate Smart Agriculture. The, the Phase GPI is a joint programming initiative launched by the European Union to promote research about challenges faced by agriculture and food security with regard to climate change. The consortium of the Grass Landscape project gathered in RAI on Ecole Pratique des Hautes Etudes in France, IPK in Germany, IBERS in the UK and ILVO in Belgium. The activity in Provolium Call was coordinated by myself at INRAE and Evelyn Villner at IPK, and Apalmi from Nodjin participated as the chair of the working group for forages, and Stefan Weiss from IPK participated as the UISCO coordinator. Other members of the working group for forages also broke their expertise in the activity. I will first start by a brief uh, overview of the Grass Landscape project which was the background of the activity. From the long-term work of the Working Group for Forages, we knew that more than 3,500 ac uh, 3, accession from the natural diversity of perennial ryegrass were maintained in European gene banks. And most of these accessions were recorded in the database of the Working Group with passport data. Using this information, we selected 416 accessions maintained in the European gene banks of the working group. And we also choose 22 accessions from the USDA gene bank. This made a total of 427 acc accessions from perennial ryegrass, plus 11 accessions from related species. These accessions were tested in field trials in three locations in France, Germany, Belgium, and phenotype on the high throughput phenotyping platform at IPK. And high frequencies of populations were obtained for more than 500,000 SNPs from genotyping by sequencing and by resequencing in some candidate genes. Environmental conditions at site of collection of populations were documented from mining environmental databases and more specifically climate databases. This whole set of information was used to implement an innovative methodological frame combining phylogeography, quantitative genetics, and landscape genomics in order to, uh, uh, to discover genomic polymorph polymorphisms involved in climatic adaptation. Now, briefly, some uh, main results. Uh, the genomic data from uh, sequencing gave us the opportunity to undertake a phylogeographic reconstruction of the expansion of perennial ryegrass across Europe during the Quaternary era. Contrary to previous belief, we found that the expansion of perennial ryegrass happened during the Pleistocene period, and thus it largely predates the onset of agriculture in Europe. Another interesting result is that the most ancestral populations 
were found in northern Italy and the Mediterranean islands, Corsica and Sardinia. Introgressions of genomic diversity from Lonium multiflorum and Lonium rigidum were found in this area, as well as in the Balkans and Anatolia. To target the main objectives of the project, we implemented an innovative method to detect adaptive loci on the genome. This method used in the same analysis genomic polymorphism data, phenotypic data, and environmental data at site of origin of populations. With this method, we were able to identify putatively adaptive loci, the phenotypic responses associated with these adaptive loci and the environmental selection pressures that impose selection at these loci. We found 633 adaptive loci, 374 of them being located in or in the neighborhood of a known gene. The figure on this slide displays the first plan of the canonical analysis, which is at the core of this method. On the top graph, SNPs are represented by dots. Putatively adaptive loci are the outlier loci represented on the external crown of purple dots. Below, on the uh, left graph, the direction of main climatic selection pressures are represented. And on the right graph, we have the corresponding main phenotypic responses. Some of the adaptive loci found were linked to adaptation to winter cold stresses, and other uh, to summer draft and heat stresses, and the phenotypic responses we observed were fully consistent with adaptive strategies known in functional ecology. Now, come back to uh, the HCPGR activity. This activity had three main, main tasks. The first task was to register as many as possible of accession using Grassonscape into the UNESCO database and to secure these accessions in the European Forage Collection, which is the contribution of the Working Group for Forages to Aegis. The second task was to make some information collected in the frame of grass landscape publicly available as characterization and evaluation data and as descriptors of collection site via a forage crop portal connected to the UNESCO database. And the third task was to use new knowledge delivered by the Grass Landscape project to set up a core collection of natural populations of perennial wild grass to be flagged on the Jurisco Forage Crop Portal. For practical implementation of the activity, we had two meetings with all participants, a first one in Paris in December 2018, and a second one at the Research Center of IPK in Gartersleben in September 2019. Then there were several video interactions between myself, Evelyn Wilner, and Stefan Weiss until the end of the activity. We started the task one by writing a memorandum that was sent to curators of ACPGR for each gene banks. This memorandum aimed to motivate gene bank curators to register their accessions used in grass landscape into the UNESCO database and to flag them as ages. The memorandum presented the rationale and goals of the activity and more specifically those of task one. And to help curators, it recalled them the processes to upload accession to UNESCO and to flag them as ages. The gene bank curators were then invited to interact with their national focal points for URISCO and national coordinators for ages. On the table on, the, uh, on this slide, uh, we can see that some improvements were obtained. The state of play was already fairly good at the beginning of the activity for registration of accessions to URISCO, and thus the possible improvement was actually limited. But the improvement was, has been more significant for new accessions in ages. We can see that progress was obtained for almost all gene banks. 
intends to a first part uh, of the activity of the task was to uh, upload characterization and evaluation data uh, recorded with Grasslandscape into Eurisco. In Grasslandscape, 385 accessions were phenotyped along with 10 control cultivars in three locations with, with three complete blocks per location. The three trial sites were Pearl Island at IPK in Germany, Melle at Ilvo in Belgium, and Lusignan at Inrai in France. On the right uh, side of the slide, we have, as an example, an airshot of the field trial in Lusignan, taken in June 2017. In each location, various traits related to forage use and possibly to environmental adaptation were recorded. These traits related to phenology, morphology, dynamics of vegetative growth, disease resistance, investment in seed production, forage quality, tolerance to winter and summer stresses, and persistency at the end of the trial. During the second workshop at Gattersleben, it was agreed to upload trait means of locations at each record date in each location. This detailed information was considered as necessary in order that future users can extract the information that best suits their needs. Data were formatted according to the Eurisco guidelines on the send to Stefan, who uploaded the data to Eurisco after obtaining the agreement of relevant national focus points. On this slide, you have a screenshot of the forage crop portal for the query of characterization and evaluation data of a given accession. On the left, you can see uh, a description of the field trial in which the trait was recorded. Here, it was Mele at Ilvo. Then uh, we have the start on end years of the trial, the trait name, the trait value, and on the right, you have a description of the trait method. The second part of task two dealt with the upload of climate descriptors of collection sites to the forage crop portal. For grass landscape, we obtain high resolution spatial grids across Europe of norms of climate variables. And from this, we computed several grids of bioclimatic variables. We notably computed grids for 27 variables similar to the bioclim variables that are commonly used in ecological sciences. The list of these 27 bioclim like variables is displayed, is displayed here on the left side of the slide. And on the right side, you have the map of spatial distribution of one of these variables. Here it is isothermality. During the second workshop at Gattersleben, we decided to upload the values at collection site of visa of accessions of the 27 bioclim like variables on the Eurisco forage crop portal. As it can be seen on this screenshot of the forage crop portal, it is now possible to bruise the value of the bioclim like variables for any Eurisco accession used in grass and cape. Then in task three, we work to set up a core collection of natural populations of perennial ryegrass. In grass landscape, we undertook a partition of accessions based on their allelic frequencies at around 500,000 SNPs. This resulted in seven clusters, which mainly reported for the natural structure of perennial ryegrass diversity across Europe that is shaped by the history of expansion of the species and by other demographic factors. We undertook another partitions of accessions based on phenotypic data recorded in the three trial sites. This phenotypic partition resulted in three clusters consistent with phenotypic adaptation to different climatic conditions. On the map here, you can see the seven genetic clusters with different colors and the three phenotypic clusters with different shapes of site marks. 
to choose accession for the core collection, we use the cross partition between the genetic and phenotypic partitions, which resulted in 17 clusters. We selected accessions in each cluster of the cross partition. We tried to evenly represent the different clusters, but we selected a bit more accessions in the clusters that had the widest spatial size and that included the largest number of accessions. We finally uh, set up two levels of core collection, a small level that included 159 accessions. It was considered as a minimum size to obtain a relevant representation of the initial set. This small level is displayed on the left side map. We set up a second large level, including 211 accessions, which is expected to provide a bit more exhaustive representation of the world diversity of perennial ryegrass. This large level is on the right, right side of the map. No, on the right side map. For inclusion in core collection, we only selected accessions flagged as ages or agreed to be flagged as ages in next future. As an exception, we included in the two levels of core collections some accessions from the IBERS gene bank. Also, they were not planned to be flagged as ages. This was done because these accessions example some important areas of Europe that are not covered by other gene banks. Here we have a screenshot of the page of the forage crop portal that enables to select and browse accessions. If we select the genus Lorium, we have now three switch buttons set by Stefan that enable to select either the uh, all access risk accessions used in grass landscape or accessions from the large core collections or accessions from the small core collection. Now to end this presentation, we can draw some lessons from both the grass landscape project and the CPGR activity. First, results from the grass landscape project showed that ex situ collections of natural populations of grass, of grass and species are relevant scientific material. They can be successfully used to reveal phylogeographic patterns at continental scale and patterns of phenotypic and genomic adaptation in response to large-scale environmental variations. Ex situ collections could in fact be useful material to investigate various questions at large spatial scale, relevant to the community of plant breeding and genetic resources conservation, but also relevant to a wider community, including ecological sciences. It would certainly be worthwhile to promote this wider use of our ex situ collections. Result from grass landscape also suggests that ex situ collections of grass and species remain useful genetic resources for plant breeding. In grass and landscape, we found that breeders have likely used only a limited part of the natural diversity of permeable red grass. The figure on this slide shows that the genetic background of modern varieties of permeable red grass is mainly related to the natural diversity of Northwestern Europe. However, we found that original adaptive genomic diversity from other parts of Europe could help the adaptation of perennial ryegrass to climate change. So we could reasonably suspect that other useful natural genetic variability could also be found for targeting other improvements in perennial ryegrass, as well as in other species. Another lesson we can draw is that practices of the community of genetic resources for forage species have been efficient to capture and maintain the genetic diversity between and within natural populations of perennial ryegrass. Obviously, the guidelines provided by the ACPGR Working Group for Foragers 
in several decades have greatly contributed to this result and the working group should continue this efficient work in the future. New collections performed during the grass and scale project also raise the fact that natural populations of grass and species are incre increasingly threatened in their natural environment by several factors like overseeding with cultivars, environmental changes and conversion to tilled acreage. Ex situ collections of the natural diversity of forage species thus remain unique genetic resources. And thus, in the future, we should continue the long-term work undertaken since several decades to maintain these useful collections with high operating standards. To end this presentation, this slide is illustrate the diversity of natural populations of perennial ryegrass. The shots were taken in June 2017 at Lusignan. At this date, the populations uh, had elongated fertile stems, and we can observe the wide diversity in, in length and density of fertile stems from one population to another. So, thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jean-Paul. That was a really interesting presentation and impressive amount of work and uh, good results. I, I would like to ask you immediately uh, before offering the, the floor to others, how the limited budget of this uh, uh, activity that was 15,000 euro was it a constraint for how did you manage to <laughs> convince people to work around uh, this subject with uh, such a little amount okay for um it was not uh, a problem to have uh, the 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 world data we needed because um having this data was funded by the previous grass and skate project so um uh, but um, uh, with the available budget of the activity, we were able to have uh, only uh, two meetings of uh, with all participants. And maybe if we add more uh, budget, we will add uh, a third meeting, which um, had been uh, quite useful also, yes. That's the main limiting factor. It's uh, the we can uh, uh, we would have be happy to have this third meeting <laughs> okay thank you thank you jean paul and now i would like to open the floor to maybe national coordinators if they want to ask uh, management questions initially but also there are very few national coordinators so i'm not sure if that is the case you can raise hand in uh, with the appropriate button if you want but if not um then if any anyone could uh, could ask questions so please raise your hand if you want to ask any question Okay, Susanne, Susanne Barth. Uh, Hello. Go yeah. ahead. Good afternoon. Um, I found the grouping with the phenotypic clustering very interesting. Uh, um, can you say which uh, phenotypic characteristics went into the phenotypic clustering? Yes. Um, the, the, the clustering was based on the, uh, all the traits uh, I uh, showed on the, uh, the, the slide uh, about um, um, sending uh, characterization and evaluation data um, to Eurisco. It's the same uh, set of, uh, of uh, phenotypic data. Then uh, from this clustering, we had uh, three main clusters. And uh, these clusters 
were uh, fully consistent with um, uh, adaptation to different climates. Um, one uh, uh, cluster um, was consistent with adaptation to a, a climate with cold winter. Uh, in this cluster, uh, the population had uh, a late start of spring growth and uh, a, a late uh, uh, earliness, a, a late uh, ending date, uh, a late ending date. And um, they tend to uh, to grow and stay green in summer. Mm -hmm. um, the the second cluster was uh, at the showed, showed an adaptation to uh, um, uh, warm climates with um, uh, uh, on uh, uh, warm summers. Uh, for this cluster, uh, the trend was that uh, population. Uh, be, begin growth very early in spring, and some population also tend to grow in in, in winter. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a, a very early um, uh, maturation of of seeds, and uh, um, the, the production also of, of seeds is, is very uh, important. And this is a, a, a way to uh, to adapt to a very to very stressful uh, summers. If the, the population is likely to die during summer, it can uh, recover from seeds in in uh, in autumn. And then mm -hmm. the third cluster was the the cluster of population population uh, growing in in uh, areas where there are no uh, stressful. Uh, uh, climatic conditions that is no uh, uh, very cold winter and no uh, very hot and dry summer and uh, in, in this uh, for these populations um, the, the the traits um, were traits of adaptation to uh, high competition for acquisition of resources so uh, this population mm -hmm. tend to uh, to uh, grow very quickly in spring and tend to have a quite early uh, date of uh, of flowering. Is it um, correct? Does it answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I have another uh, question regarding the uh, the um, uh, uh, the phenotypic diversity. Did you see any geographic pattern uh, and influence uh, of climate? Uh, on crown rust uh, 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 resistance. Mm -hmm. um, well, we we um, we have not been able to to really uh, relate uh, uh, um, uh, the resistance of to disease to uh, to um, to climate. With this data set, is, it was not really uh, uh, the, the the association with of was not really uh, clear. Thank you. I, I just found, you know, when we looked ourselves at genetic resources that often a limiting factor for the use was often, you know, uh, 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 not not satisfactory uh, disease resistance. And I just thought maybe there was a uh, climate uh, pattern maybe to be seen. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Suzanne and Jean-Paul. Now we have a question from uh, Imke Tormann, National Coordinator from Germany. Go ahead, Imke. As soon as they allow you. So, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for this interesting uh, presentation. I think it's a good idea to share the results of the uh, of the projects in in, in these webinars. Uh, and I have a question regarding the uh, the Aegis collection. I think it's it's an important aspect that accessions that that are dealt with or in in these projects are possibly placed into into the Aegis collection. And I wanted to know uh, 
whether you had developed a, a certain strategy or to to convince uh, gene banks or, or collection holders or national coordinators to do that actually to flag them as Aegis or were there difficulties to convince them or was this all easy going? I just wanted to hear your experience about this aspect of the project. I think it was not so uh, difficult to uh, convince them uh, uh, first because of the um, uh, the long term of uh, the long work of the working group uh, since uh, many years and mm -hmm. uh, the, the uh, gene bank curators uh, know um, the, the, the way of work of the working group and um, uh, it's I think it's relatively easy to uh, to uh, speak with them and to uh, um, to convince them. Um, the, 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 as, as it was shown in a, a previous um, activity uh, coordinated by Anna Palme, the, the main uh, difficulty to uh, convince uh, gene bank creators is the, the means they have to, uh, uh, to, to maintain their collections. They are uh, uh, often a bit uh, afraid because they are not sure that they will have the, the, the capacity to uh, to maintain uh, uh, their collections. So maybe I know if uh, Evelyn Wilner is is uh, connected because Evelyn uh, um, uh, did a lot to uh, contact uh, the different gene banks. So maybe she could uh, she could add something about this. Yes, hello, Jean-Paul and all. Mm -hmm. uh, greetings to all of you. <laughs> and thank you, Jean-Paul, for the nice presentation. You have uh, all uh, results very good um, um, summarized. And uh, yes, Imke, uh, in, 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 uh, for the most gene banks or uh, decorators are willing uh, to, to flag ages accessions, this is no problem. But uh, sometimes we, we uh, came not further with the uh, national focal points, in my opinion, ne? Stefan? <laughs> but I think uh, we, we have flagged all ex, uh, um, accessions in the uh, forage crop portal, but um, and, and uh, all uh, accessions are flagged as ages so far the curators and national focal points agreed it's a draft yes okay but for for the collection of the czech republic we have no agreement isn't it right Stefan? this was uh, with regard to the phenotypic data not uh, uh, with regard to the composition of eggs ah so that's a this was the difference. Yeah. Okay, so in, in for ages it's, it's no problem, but we want to have all uh, results, also phenotypic data, into the forage crop portal because we are thinking it's very useful for the for the users, and uh, for us it was not possible to convince uh, the the yeah colleagues in in Czech Republic, and I'm wondering. Uh, why uh, uh, she she cannot uh, agree to this? Maybe you have an explanation, or you have experiences, or what can we do that uh, uh, Czech colleagues uh, agree to this? Also that all data are available in the in the uh, forage crop portal. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Thank you, Evelyn. I, that's an interesting uh, information you are offering, and uh, we can perhaps investigate it more. But Jean Paul, you wanted to say something about this? So, yeah, I can add that uh, also for, for France, we, uh, our gene bank in Lusignan is, of course, willing to, um, to uh, flag accession to ages. But as you know, um, we are still waiting for France to sign 
the memorandum of understanding and then uh, uh, INRAI has to sign the associated membership. Um, um, yes, and uh, this, this is planned, uh, I think, and uh, should come, uh, I hope, quite soon. But uh, it's okay. And then we have the case also of IBERS. Um, the UK uh, signed the memorandum uh, of, uh, of ages, but um, IBERS didn't sign a membership agreement. So uh, uh, our colleagues of IBERS were not able to flag their, their accessions to ages. But they are still willing to uh, contribute in the working group for four ages. And uh, they agreed uh, that their accessions will uh, be in the core collection. So that's the situation. <laughs> Thank you, Jean-Paul. And I can uh, confirm that France is really reaching the, the point of joining ages because I have seen the, the final document called the Declaration of Intent that uh, will be signed soon by the by the minister. So okay. uh, France will be a member of, of ages. But let's go now to another question that is raised by Theo van Hintum. National Coordinator for the Netherlands. Go ahead, Tim. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. great. First of all, thank you, uh, Jean-Paul, for the for the presentation. Very interesting. It sounds like money well spent, uh, and that's uh, that's a good thing. And also agree with Imke that having these type of presentations and short webinars uh, makes complete sense. I have a technical question. You distinguish between small and large core collections. Uh, how did you uh, find out how large these things should be, since the, the sizes didn't seem to be chosen uh, um, um, uh, by yourself? And secondly, are you aware of the fact that you could also easily allow the user to indicate what size core collection he or she wants to have and then generate it on the spot? Which would, of course, add a lot of functionality to this uh, to this concept. Mm -hmm. um, we um, um, uh, decided the the, the raw uh, side of the core collection by uh, from the the work of a PhD student that uh, worked uh, in the frame of uh, grass landscape. Um, he, um, uh, he worked on he, he worked on the the, the idea of um, um, using these accessions to um, set up a, a, a calibration set uh, for um, genomic prediction of populations, and uh, he found that um, when you reach around 150 um, populations um, selected um, uh, at random, you, um, you can have a, a, a good calibration set. And uh, he also found that uh, if um, this calibration set is not set up at random, but if you uh, try to uh, 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 maximize the distance between uh, accessions um, and if also if you use also uh, well, if you combine genetic distances and uh, um, geographical distances uh, you can have a, a very good calibration set so uh, we uh, consider that um, if we choose uh, between uh, 150 and uh, 200 accessions, we could have a good uh, uh, core collection. And uh, then it was also our core collection were optimized from uh, the genetic phenotypic and also a distance uh, point of view. So um, we hope it's <laughs> that it's a good uh, core collection. Then. Uh, I think that with 150 accessions, you could have a, a good uh, core collection. And then we, the large uh, core collection was 
more because we sometimes we thought it was a pity to uh, let some accessions uh, uh, beside. Um, and then uh, we have also uh, the, the 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 project um, during the next months to uh, confirm that uh, these uh, core collections are efficient. Um, uh, I, I show you uh, some slide about uh, what we did for uh, uh, the, the, the analysis we uh, used to um, uh, discover genomic um, adaptation to discover uh, adaptive loci. We, we plan to uh, uh, make again this analysis only with the 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 uh, the, the accessions of uh, the, the, the 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 core collection. And uh, to check whether we will uh, find back uh, the, the same results as with the, the whole set of accessions uh, of, of grass landscape. So, uh, um, did, did I answer to your question? You answered the first part of it, yes. The second yeah. you didn't, but uh, probably you're not aware of the possibility to create a structure that allows a user to say, I need 50 accessions and uh, get a core collection of 50. Okay, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that could be something to consider for, for Stefan, perhaps even. Mm -hmm. But thank you, yes. Thank you, Theo, for the suggestion and question. And um, I would have another question about the uh, forage crop portal. How was the experience of creating this portal and uh, what advantages brings to the to the working group that uh, that the risk was not able to to provide and was it um, difficult to set up this forage portal can you say something about it you and or uh, stefan mm. yeah maybe it's a uh, more a question for uh, stefan <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, uh, setting up this uh, forage crop portal was uh, quite uh, straightforward uh, because all the the data, the passport data and the phenotypic data, gets uh, automatically provided by Eurisco. So we only had to set up this uh, search interface and uh, the visualization capabilities, and uh, this gives. Um, the, the possibility to the forage working group to focus on information that um, can't be, be managed in, in Eurisco to, to put uh, additional information around this, this passport data and definitive data, data, for example, this bioclimatic uh, variables. These are uh, crop specific um, descriptors, so to speak, or we, we, we call this crop specific uh, information. Um, that are not uh, managed in Eurisco, but can now be uh, shown in this uh, forge crop portal. And this was the setting up this portal and maintaining this portal um, does not uh, uh, take much uh, time. Okay, thank you, Stefan. So you, your message is also to other working groups that they could consider if needed something similar. Yes. Okay, I do not see any other questions. And so I would um, like to thank very much, Jean Paul. Welcome. Sorry. Break. Yes, who? Sorry, Lorenzo. Can, can yes. I ask uh, um, Susanne something? <laughs> Susanne, do sure. you hear me? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, to, to, to Susanne's questions uh, um, in, in direction of rust resistance, uh, we, we have uh, in, in uh, previous um, trials uh, investigated rust resistance and maybe if you are interested in uh, to find some material what is, uh, which is um, uh, rust resistance, then you can contact me please. Okay, thank you, Eveline. Will do. Yeah, and and nice to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> and I should say actually that uh, I should inform everyone that uh, Susanne is uh, the new chair of the Foragers Working Group, 
with two vice chairs appointed, uh, Evelyn Wilner and uh, Anna Palme, the, the former chair. So we have a new team in the Forges Working Group. Yes, thank, thank you, Lorenzo. And, <laughs> and I, I, I would like to thank all of the uh, or members uh, of the group which have um, cooperated with us in this direction. And it was a long, long story from 2015 to now uh, to, to reach this uh, progress and this results. And uh, John Powell has, uh, yeah, always the, the input uh, has given and, and uh, without his um, help, it was not possible to do such a lot of work. <laughs> Thank you, John Paul. <laughs> Thank you also uh, for, to you, Evelyn. Yeah, you and were... I'm very, very happy because I'm, uh, yeah, or I have a long tradition in the ECPGR working group on forages. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, maybe you all know uh, that we have uh, tried to, to in the 90s, uh, to create a core collection. Uh, we have done an, a trial uh, from uh, 96 to 98, and um, the, the power uh, was, was missing to analyze all results uh, from uh, this uh, trial. And now we have got uh, this uh, progress reached and I'm very, very happy. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. And uh, I can remind you that you can find the report of this uh, activity on the CPGR website in the grant scheme uh, page. So there is the activity report and, and more information if you are interested. And so with this, uh, I think we can uh, come to the end of this uh, first webinar and uh, we will have another one uh, in, uh, I think in one month time. I don't know if Nora can give you any anticipation of uh, the next or, uh, or in any case, you can uh, stay tuned and, uh, and we will uh, spread information. Yes, so no no so, news yet. Yes. I'm sorry, you cannot see me. No news yet, but we, we plan to have another one in one month, one month and a half. So probably before the Easter break. So uh, we'll keep you posted. Thank you. So we are looking for volunteers in, in any case. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. And um, see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.